Paper was like gold in medieval times. I want tobacco. Sugar. That everything we thought we knew about the world might turn out to be completely wrong. Deserts, the driest places on Earth, covering more than a fifth of all the world's landmass, as dangerous to life as the highest peak or the coldest glacier. But in these harsh and barren wastelands, nature endures. People have lived in the desert since the beginning of time. Resilient and resourceful, they have developed unique cultures and deep spiritual bonds with these arid lands. But the modern world of commerce and industry is encroaching on the desert, claiming its resources, changing the delicate balance of life. Now, more than ever, desert people must adapt to survive. This series tells their story of struggle and endeavor, of humanity's continuing relationship with the most challenging places on Earth. There's just one word that's needed to describe the Atacama. Dry. Parts of the desert are completely arid, virtually sterile. Not even bacteria survive. The Atacama stretches for a thousand kilometers along the shores of Chile and Peru. Coastal mountains to the west and the giant Andes to the east block out the rain clouds. In some places, it hasn't rained for four centuries. And yet, miraculously, people have found ways to live here. The human face of the Atacama expresses joy as well as a simple determination to survive. But there's a darker side to this desert story. The Atacama is so dry, it preserves like nowhere else the dirty secrets of its ancient past. And there's no hiding place here for the evidence of much more recent terrors. Today, water has become a precious private commodity. Mining corporations buy it up, residents go thirsty. Yet these barren, moistureless plains may give us our best chance of finding water and life billions of miles away. A place awash with contradictions. This is the Atacama, the driest desert. In the giant shadow of the Andes is where the high desert and the story of human survival begins. Benita Panera is a survivor. For 60 years, she's farmed an isolated patch of land in these mountains. Vivía con mi mamá. Mi mamá falleció el año pasado. Y me quedé sola. Pues yo no tengo hijos, no tengo, no me he casado, nada. Soy sola. 3,000 meters above sea level, life for Benita is a daily battle with the elements. En el invierno pasa mucho viento, mucha tierra, que hace mucho frío y uno no sé, 
ahí es un poco difícil. Benita's animals are her lifeline, providing milk and meat and something to trade. She has no electricity and no running water. She used to walk several kilometers to draw supplies from a mountain spring. But these days, the journey is too much for her. She's forced to depend on the generosity of neighbors. Even so, she has to eke out every last drop. Vienen todas las semanas y me dejan nada. Dura como una semana, dos semanas, o más de 15 días, 20 días, según la cantidad que uso. Benita's most dependable helper is her nephew, René. René feels a family responsibility to lend a hand as Benita's only close relative. As it happens, it's also a civic duty for him. He's the head man of the nearest village, Aikina. Life there can also be a struggle. There are various things that concern us. Lo que veíamos, por ejemplo, en la calidad de vida que tiene nuestra gente acá. Uh, estamos a pleno siglo XXI y todavía podemos ver, digamos, donde nuestra gente vive tal cual como un poco como la prehistoria, sin tener agua potable, digamos, mediante cañería, sin tener alcantarillado, sin más bien usando a campo libre. Sprawling across the hillside, Aikina looks for all the world like a substantial settlement. In fact, its permanent population is no more than 70. Most of these buildings are holiday homes. For much of the year, they lie empty until it's party time. Aikina's festival lasts for days. The festivities honor the Lady of Guadalupe. The story goes that the Virgin Mary appeared on this very spot in 1646. But no one seems to be quite certain of the exact date the miracle happened. And some say the Virgin showed herself more than once. The people of Aikina staged several celebrations, marking one of the most holy events in its history. Family ties are strong here, and everybody has a part to play. Rene's aunt makes the popcorn. It's a real feast for everyone. But this isn't just a little family occasion. At the height of festive season during the first week of September, the town's population swells to 75,000. Catholicism takes center stage. But religion here is enriched with customs that were already sacred when Christianity arrived with the Spanish conquistadors. The villagers are descendants of the Aymara, indigenous people who have farmed in the shadow of the Andes for more than 2,000 years. The costumes, the music, the dances all date back to an era before Europeans ever set foot here. So too does the secret of how the Aymara managed to establish themselves here. kilometers east of the village lie the ancient ruins of Topain. The evidence here is of an Aymaran village that's more than a thousand years old. In those days, the desert was even drier than it is today. Yet archaeologists like Cesar Pacero are finding increasing proof that even through the super drought, the population here not only survived, it thrived. Los habitantes de Topaín, un grupo de unas pocas familias, fue capaz de aprovechar de forma super eficiente y muy eficaz la muy escasa agua que había en este lugar. The keys to success were these rock channels, 
the arteries of a sophisticated water distribution system. The irrigation watered these specially built terraces, nourishing all the crops the Aymara needed. But with no rainfall, where did the water come from? The answer is in the very Andean peaks that block the rain clouds from reaching the desert. The summits catch what little precipitation there is and redirect it to glacial springs and underground rivers. The Aymara were able to pinpoint these hidden sources. By building simple dams, they could even store water for when the streams ran dry. La presa tenía una salida en esta parte de acá, que vemos por aquí, un agujero que habrían tapado o abierto en el momento en el que necesitasen cerrar o abrir el paso de agua, que realmente esta gente fue capaz de diseñar una forma de producción y un modo de vida tan eficientes que todavía hoy siguen siendo válidos y que por lo tanto eran entonces tan modernos como lo pueden ser hoy en día. A thousand years later, the precious knowledge has not been entirely lost. Today, on the hill slopes beneath Aikina, there's a hidden oasis. Terraces of vegetation are irrigated by water channeled from a mountain spring using techniques pioneered a millennium ago. And the valley below shows what's possible when you husband scarce resources with skill and ingenuity. Turning the desert green, the people of Aikina are also celebrating their Aymaran heritage. There's plenty to give thanks for, but even at party time, Rene can't be entirely free of worry. His family has lived in Aikina as far back as their memory goes. But there's a big change on the horizon, a change that Rene fears could rob his children of a future here. A few kilometers to the west, there are more ruins, the remains of a village that once thrived like Aikina. Rene is keen for his son to understand what happened here. Esto antiguamente, todo esto lo que tú ves acá, este era era una vega. Acá habían llamos, corderos, habían cabras, habían parinas, patos, de todo. Snow melt water from underground streams was what kept this valley fertile. Today, that water is being redirected for industrial use and in massive quantities. Every hour, wells like this one pump millions of liters down the pipeline. All that's left is the little that leaks out. Rene's nightmare is that one day big business will come for the water that keeps his village green. Yo desde acá, donde tú ves, con todo este desierto que tú ves acá, yo te invito a ti a que tú seas un cuidador y seas un defensor de corazón de, de nuestras tierras. ¿Ah? ¿Estás de acuerdo? Sí. Ya. Ya dijo. But the challenge may be far bigger than a boy could imagine. His home sits right next to one of the richest mineral fields on the planet. The ground may be parched of water, but it's full of precious metals. 
gold, silver, iron, copper, lithium. All these have been laid down here by geological processes unique to the desert environment. Extracting the mineral wealth can be hugely profitable. That's why more than 700 mines are now operating in the Atacama. Chile is the world's biggest producer of copper, and 25% of the world's lithium lies beneath its surface rock and salt lakes. Lithium is an essential component in many familiar industrial products, like car batteries. Without it, the modern world would outrun itself. But the extreme desert environment that forged the Atacama's underground wealth is also the biggest obstacle to extracting it. Mining requires water and on an industrial scale. And water, of course, is the one resource that's in short supply. This is Kiawa. According to official records, it's the driest town on Earth. Natives of Kiawa can only dream of rain on their faces. The town's dusty weather gauge hasn't registered measurable rainfall for 40 years. It's just as well Andres Palape has something else to occupy his time. He keeps the only hotel in town. Each time a guest checks in, there's a special conversation to be had. On a daily basis, the residents of Quillagua use 20 times less water than people in the United States. The water they are allowed to use has to be brought here by truck. No, no, hay mucha agua aquí. El agua es, es bien, es bien concreta. Hay que, hay que ocupar lo justo y necesario. Kiawa fights to survive, despite the record-breaking drought and the dryness of the landscape all around. Remarkably, there's evidence of human settlement here stretching back 10,000 years and more, longer than almost anywhere else in South America. An ancient civilization known as the Chinchuro flourished here. The landscape itself bears the evidence. The dry desert has preserved this rock art, prehistoric statements in stone still visible thousands of years later. And there's other proof of ancient human presence here in Kiawa. Proof that's dramatic and macabre. Mummies. Vessels of communication between the living and the spirit world. The ancients painted their dead and mummified them with open eyes and mouths. In magic rituals, they were said to see this world and the next, and to speak to both. The mummies have been dated as roughly 2,000 years old. In any other museum, precious finds like these would have to be preserved in a dehumidified environment. 
But caretaker Felisa Sosa isn't concerned about that. She knows the atmosphere here is so exceptionally dry that nothing rots. <laughs> One body in Felissa's collection has a quite separate history. This man is from Asia. He died just a century and a half ago. He was a slave, a Chinese coolie, tricked into crossing the Pacific and forced to work in mining or farming. Tests show he had an enlarged liver. It's probable his masters paid him nothing but alcohol. His body was abandoned where he died. The desert did the rest, preserving his body. Graphic evidence of Kiawa's slave trading past. In choosing to trade here, his 19th century masters were no fools. Kiawa was an oasis. The life-giving water flowed in the form of the river Lower. Fed by Andean glaciers, the Lower is the main watercourse in the Atacama. At 440 kilometers, it's Chile's longest river. For thousands of years, the waters of the Lower supported a thriving agricultural society in this valley. The signs here still read, Welcome to the spa town of Kiawa. But the reality today is very different. This evening, Andres is dining with his brother Miguel. It's a long standing family tradition. When it began, they used to feast on local delicacies like freshwater shrimp. Nowadays, the menu is much more limited. Se comía el camarón frito, se comía en picante, se comía en cocido con mayonesa. Se tomaba este sopa de camarones, que más había gallina, cualquier gallina. Conejo también, hay un criadero de conejo. Entonces también se terminó. Hoy día todo esto que comer lo congelado no. Por eso que mi mamá ahora está de argalla, porque no, no come camarones, ni pejerreyes, ni gallinas frescas. Eso sí, bueno, me encanta. Today's limited choice is due to the huge environmental change that Miguel has witnessed. Bueno, en mis manos tengo yo una, unos recuerdos del año 82, como hasta el 87, más o menos. Y acá tengo donde este mismo campo que estamos hoy día parado. When Miguel was young, the river Loa flowed freely through his parents' farmland. The family grew crops, alfalfa and maize, and they fished for shrimp, the sweet river variety for which Kiawa used to be famous. Pero más grande, era así inmenso. La tijera, era así la tijera, era inmenso. Eso pillamos con chapa de golpe. Con uno que ha listo uno va al desayuno. Un buen desayuno con cebolla frita. Era delicioso. Muy bueno. Kiawa's demise was swift. In the late 1980s, the government reassigned two thirds of the river's water for industrial use. A decade later, much worse was to follow. 125 kilometers upstream from Kiagua, is one of the world's largest copper mines. Run by government-owned Codelco, it's the only mine in the region that uses toxic compounds of xanthate in the metal extraction process. Tests prove that in 1997 and in the year 2000, levels of xanthate and mercury in the river Loa were extremely high. When there was contamination, Solaron todo, todo se, se murió, todo lo que hay a su alrededor mató el agua. Como me explicaba, como una. como petróleo, así como. Y, pero botaba una, una espuma, era muy, tenía mucha espuma esa agua. Arsenic levels were several thousand times higher than normal. 
it was a fatal dose. Tanto los camarones como los peces reyes, la alfalfa murieron en tiempo. Los animales no se les podía dar de esa agua, hay que darle agua dulce hasta que pasara el proceso de de la contaminación. What happened next sealed Kiawa's fate. Developers offered to relieve people's burdens by buying their polluted water. In Chile, water is a private commodity. Even in the Atacama, people can sell their usage rights to the highest bidder. Unable to farm the polluted and unproductive lands, many in Kiawa felt they had little choice but to sell up and leave. Entonces no es eh, que puedan echarle la culpa que vendió la gente el agua. Mi padre fue uno de los que vendió también sus derechos de agua. 75% of the town sold their polluted water to the industrialists. Now, Kiawa is dying. Almost all the young have left in search of better opportunities in the city. But the story isn't unique to Kiawa. Boom and bust is a recurring theme in the history of the Atacama. The desert is full of ghost towns. Settlements that prospered with the discovery of mineral wealth, only to be abandoned once their resources had been plundered. the Atacama is far from being mined out. Millions of years ago, this desert was covered by a huge inland sea. Over time, the boundless sunshine of the desert dried out the waters, leaving a crystal residue. With no rainfall to dissolve the crystals, other sediments were deposited directly on top. Over many millions of years, huge beds of subterranean salt formed. Sala Grande de Tarapaca is an open cast mine on the desert coast. It's one of the purest sources of natural salt on the planet. The deposits here are five kilometers wide and 45 kilometers long. There are billions of metric tons of salt here. This one mine alone is big enough to satisfy the world's demand for salt for the next 200 years. Another mineral brought the Atacama sudden wealth and sudden ruin. This is the town of Chacabuco. It was built in 1924 to facilitate the mining of one of the most lucrative compounds ever dug from the sand. Sodium nitrate otherwise known as Chile saltpeter. Formed over 20 million years by volcanic activity, saltpeter was first mined in the Atacama in the 1820s. It soon became a key ingredient in products like fertilizers and gunpowder. During the First World War, as demand boomed, hundreds of mines and processing plants worked the desert. Industrial towns were thrown up to house workers. Railways were laid down to transport the nitrate powder to the coast for export. In Chacabuco's heyday, Chile was producing two thirds of all the world's fertilizer. It was hard labor, but the workers flooded in. 
The town boasted the best amenities money could buy. A plaza, a theater, a hospital and a church. Said to be one of the most beautiful in northern Chile. But the glory days weren't to last. In the 1920s, Germany developed a synthetic saltpeter. It proved just as effective as the natural thing at a fraction of the cost. By the 1930s, the industry here was in dramatic decline. Chile's economy collapsed. Today, the Atacama is littered with abandoned saltpeter towns, nearly 200 of them. But for Chacabuco, economic collapse wasn't the end of the story. The ghost town would be resurrected in a new and dark chapter of Chile's history. On September the 11th, 1973, General Augusto Pinochet ousted Chile's democratic government in a military coup. Backed by the United States, Pinochet moved quickly to consolidate his grip on power by annihilating his socialist opponents. The new regime turned the empty houses of Chacabuco into a concentration camp for political dissidents. One thousand eight hundred prisoners were incarcerated here. Students, teachers, professionals, laborers, anyone considered an enemy of the state. In all, under Pinochet, a quarter of a million people were detained. Behind the barbed wire, under the watchtowers, Torture and violence were meted out. But it's taken a lifetime and a group of resolute women to uncover the truth about the most terrible atrocities. They took place outside the camp gates, witnessed only by a guilty few. Violeta Berrios lives in Calama a city deep in the desert, alone with her five dogs. Violetta's life wasn't always like this. Forty years ago, she was a young woman in love. Marion era un hombre común y corriente, trabajador, pertenecía a un partido de izquierda y eso lo llevó a la tumba. In September 1973, a Chilean army squad was heading for Calama. They would become known as the Caravan of Death. Led by army brigadier General Sergio Ariano Stark, the squad descended on four cities in northern Chile. Their mission, to identify socialist sympathizers. Mario was one of those who was targeted. Mario was detained on the 30th of September. There was a subcommissary. And there they took all the detained. And there they tortured them and they did all they wanted. Yo no lo había visto desde el 30 hasta el 13 o 14 de octubre que lo vi. Era un guiñapo humano. O sea, había perdido todo el peso que tenía. Eh, tenía tajitos en la cara, en la frente, en los brazos. Y yo nunca me voy a olvidar, por Dios Mario, le digo yo, ¿cómo estás? Me dieras el cuerpo, me dijo. Violetta would never see Mario again. 
the caravan of death had got its man. Fui a la cárcel a preguntar por Mario y ya Mario no estaba, eran como las seis de la tarde. Y ahí me fui ante esta familia, la familia Rodríguez. Cuando llego a la casa de la familia Rodríguez, siento llantos, pataletas, gritos y golpeé suavemente y me dice, los mataron, los mataron. Mario and 22 others from Calama had been murdered. Shot or stabbed, their bodies were thrown into a mass grave in the desert. Grieving wives, mothers, sisters, daughters were desperate to discover their fate. Their anguish forged an unbreakable bond between them all. Meeting in secret, they became known as the women of Kalama. Forty years later, they still come together every week to share their memories. Lorena was just a small child when her father disappeared. She sought comfort from friends, only to find that Pinochet's terror had thrown up barriers of distrust. Todo así se confabulaba en todas las familias. ¿Cómo te llamas? Ah, y tu papá de qué bueno fusil. Ah, fusilado. Y ahí el linde, al tiro. Por lo menos más de uno de nosotros nos pasó esa situación. But the women of Kalama would not be intimidated. In secret, they resolved to find the bodies of their loved ones. Just months after the murders, they began to search the desert. It was 17 long years before they found what they were looking for. They dug up the mass grave expecting to exhume bodies. All that they found were fragments. Ellos fueron enterrados en una parte y después los sacaron. Y nosotros lo que hemos encontrado son restos de restos. O sea, no es no es gran cosa. Son pedacitos, son vértebras, son falange, uña, piezas molares. Today, this memorial marks the exact spot where their search ended. But in a desert that preserves the dead like nowhere else, a mystery remained. Why did they fail to find whole bodies in the sand? Eventually in 2007, more than 30 years after the men disappeared, Witnesses came forward to explain the mystery. The women finally learned the truth. A few months after the executions, realizing the desert would preserve the evidence of their crimes, the military had returned to the mass grave. They dug up the human remains using bulldozers. They loaded them into a transport plane and dumped them into the sea. We may never know precisely what inhumanities happened here that night. Yet the women of Kalama are relentless in their search for answers. But it's que es angustiante. Yo ya, o sea, me encuentro superada esta situación ya. O sea, pero Hay que seguir, hay que seguir haciendo las cosas nomás. Aunque los sentimientos sean otros, pero hay momentos que no se puede. Yo ya no puedo ya. Ya, chao.
everywhere, the Atacama tests the human heart. But the challenges are at their most extreme at its western edge. The world's driest desert sits right next to a vast body of water. Along the Pacific coast, a string of small settlements are fighting for survival. At the edge of the continent, communities like Chanavaya are so remote they can feel as though they've been forgotten. The river Loa sweeps into the sea here, or would do if it had not been so depleted by industry upstream. What little water does trickle through is heavily polluted. So Chanavaya has to depend on water brought in by truck, and for weeks the vital delivery simply hasn't shown up. Lo más importante es el agua. El camión no puede estar más de 10 días sin venir a la población, porque eso me va a obligar a declarar la población insalubre. Matters are desperate, and the authorities aren't returning their calls. No sé, pues es increíble. But today sees an electioneering visit by the district mayor. Electoral coincidence or not, earlier this morning, for the first time in 27 days, the water truck finally arrived. Chanavaya needs champions. Unfortunately, it has a very gutsy one. Sonia Moreno counts herself as lucky to have grown up here. It was a community that valued education, and inspired by her coastal childhood, she went on to graduate as a marine biologist. But now she's left a successful career in the city to join the fight for Chanavaya's future. This is a caleta very emblematic in this region. It's a caleta that doesn't have problems social problems, drugs, alcohol, prostitution, delinquency. The only one of the eight caletas del borde costero. Y es porque los pobladores están educados. Y yo pienso que con la educación de ellos vamos a llegar más lejos. Sonia takes pride in the small steps that Chanavaya has taken to help itself. Ya empezamos próximamente a instaurar las energías renovables por las calles, a iluminarles las calles, para demostrarle a la autoridad que con buena voluntad sí podemos hacer una caleta sostenible y sustentable. One natural resource that's always been available here is fish. Ellos en estos momentos, como ustedes están viendo, están pelando lo, los peces de la noche. Estos esquelones se guardan, se raspan para hacer ceviche. Y con estas cabezas, ellos hacen una sopa que es un caldillo. Todo se, todo se utiliza. But nowadays, even cleaning and cooking the fish is a problem. The area's scarce water is so polluted. One solution is to use the scales of the fish themselves to filter out pollutants in a process called biosorption. Entonces, hay que educar a las comunidades para que sepan utilizar las escamas para poder limpiar las aguas de contaminación de arsénico, que es una problemática muy común en todas las zonas rurales y también zonas urbanas de la zona norte de Chile. But there's no guarantee that Chanavaya will continue to get even the little water it does receive. Along the coast, it has a competitor for supply. These industrial reservoirs will be left to evaporate and their copper residue exported. Sonia feels Chanavaya has been left high and dry. Hoy en día no existe nada. Y esto, digamos, es debido, no al calentamiento global, esto es debido a la mano del hombre. El hombre está utilizando las aguas en las minerías y así como va mermando la vida de las poblaciones, también de la naturaleza. Sonia sees multinationals buying up the water with profits boosted by Chile's low tax rates, whilst Chanavaya is drained of social investment. Y nosotros hoy en día no estamos no tenemos voto en decir no queremos esto. Esta esta mortandad no la queremos para nuestras futuras generaciones. Nosotros queremos un medio ambiente con agua, con flora, con fauna.
For Chanavaya, every drop is precious. Locally, it's pioneering a scheme to scoop water out of thin air. These nets catch condensation from coastal fog. The droplets are piped down to the town below. Sonia is always keen to demonstrate the system to others who may adopt it across the region. It's all very low tech and it's just a start. But for Sonia, even such a small scale community project is important. It's a sign that she was right to come home and make a stand. Yo amo vivir en Chanavaya. Esto es impagable, la tranquilidad, el mar ahí mismo. Entonces, debemos luchar para no perderlo, para poder tener nuestra generación futura aquí. Lo bueno de todo esto es que nuestros chicos, los jóvenes, son los que han ido creando la conciencia ecológica. Chanavaya's struggle for survival continues. Not far away, the quest for water has quite a different meaning. Perched 2,600 meters above the coastal plain is one of the most important scientific research centers in the world. Here, at the European Southern Observatory, astronomers are searching distant galaxies. This is an internationally funded venture, a scientific oasis. Every night here is another working day. Nuestras vías están totalmente desplazadas aquí en el observatorio. Entonces, tenemos que dormir las 7 y las 2 de la tarde. A las 2 nos levantamos, venimos a tomar eh, desayuno y este es el primero de una larga serie de cafés. Hay que mantenerse despierto de alguna manera, especialmente al final del turno. Fernando Salman needs to stay alert. He's working with the world's most advanced optical instrument. It's a complex system of mirrors, which can see further into space than humanity ever has before. It's so powerful that it can distinguish distant images as small and as dim as the headlights of a car on the moon would be to the naked eye. Despite all that, it has a curiously unscientific name, the VLT, the Very Large Telescope. The VLT allows scientists here to study the molecular makeup of planets in other solar systems. Hace mucho tiempo se descubrió que cada elemento em emite luz en de un color particular. Si tú tomas sal en tu cocina y la pones en la llama del del gas, eso va, va a emitir una luz amarilla muy fuerte. Entonces cada elemento tiene una firma propia. Y tú estudias los colores del objeto, tú puedes determinar si están presentes esos elementos. Uno de estos elementos es agua. For astronomers, the search for water on distant planets is the holy grail. Where there is water, there may be life. And perhaps an answer to the fundamental question, are we alone in the universe? The Atacama is the ideal place to search for evidence. Humidity levels here are so low, there's little danger of atmospheric moisture giving a false reading. Es una paradoja que justamente la la sequedad y la falta de agua en este lugar y la poca capacidad de sostener vida que hay en este lugar es lo que hace este lugar el ideal para descubrir agua y vida en otros planetas. The Atacama is so dry but NASA road tests its Martian explorer here. Parts of this desert are effectively sterile. Not even bacteria can survive in the soil. It's the closest thing to Mars on Earth. And if NASA's probe can search out life here, it's mission ready to find life on other planets. By exploring the limits of life on Earth, Astrobiologists are hoping to learn more about how life may survive on other worlds. And there are some promising indicators. 
parece haber agua en todas partes, de hecho. Está presente hasta en la Luna, se está presente en los cometas, en los asteroides, en las lunas de Júpiter, de Saturno. Incluso está presente alrededor de agujeros negros en galaxias muy lejanas. El agua está en todas partes. Pero Fernando sabe que la presencia de agua no es suficiente. To sustain life, it must exist in a stable form. Si no tuviésemos agua en estado líquido aquí en este planeta, la vida no sería posible. No nos basta con el vapor. While the ultimate question about life on other planets remains unanswered, this unique desert location is a daily reminder to the scientists here that our home in the universe is a very special one. Planetas exactamente como la Tierra nos han encontrado. Es una de las labores que pienso que debemos dedicarle tiempo el, en dif, difundir este conocimiento que el, el, nuestro planeta es único. The Atacama, the driest desert. This place lays bare the most fundamental questions facing humanity. Questions about the world and our place in it. No one here can afford to take even the most basic necessities for granted. And yet it's a place where fortunes can be found and extracted. It reminds us that how we enrich our lives and what we pass on to our children, these are choices about the use of scarce resources. If what sustains life is worth pursuing to the ends of the universe, and if what denies life is worth exposing no matter what the cost, the Atacama reveals in the clearest possible light how the balance of nature rests in our hands.